Hey, this uh, little mini lecture is an introduction to the idea of stress, um, and in particular, axial stress. So up to this point, we've been talking about internal loadings. So basically forces and moments uh, acting within uh, a particular member. Uh, but if we want to know about um, how a material is reacting to those internal loadings, um, we need to know a little bit more. If we want to know, say, if our potato here is going to fracture, um, just knowing those internal forces uh, isn't enough because we don't have a good sense of essentially how resistant uh, to those forces our potato is. And so we might think, you know, just off the top of our heads, a, a, a thick object, a thick potato, uh, would be able to withstand uh, the same load that might fracture uh, a thinner potato. So as our little fellow here says, uh, you know, a French fry is going to break in a different way uh, than a baked potato. So how do we do that? Well, we do it with the idea of stress. Okay, stress helps us to understand um, the effect of those internal forces on the material itself. Okay. So stress is in units pascals, which are the same units as pressure, um, and that is a force per area. So the little sigma there uh, is used for uh, to identify normal stresses, um, and it tells you how much force uh, the material is being, uh, um, how much force is being applied to that material. Uh, over a given uh, space. Okay, so A here is the cross-sectional area of our member. So in this case, a thick potato uh, might have the same loading as a thinner potato, uh, but would experience lower stresses because its cross-sectional area would be bigger, uh, and then we'd be less worried about it fracturing if we knew it was uh, had a large cross-sectional area. So just to take a, the sort of very simplest um, example here, we'll have a, an axially loaded bar here of length L. So uh, it's connected to some kind of surface here and a load is applied to it, uh, a tensile load that's pulling on it. So if we wanted to find the distribution of resultant forces in this bar, we could section it between zero and 11 uh, in much the way we've done uh, in the last couple of uh, lectures. Uh, and what we'd find is, uh, at any given section, right, um, I would have a load in which n was equal to p. Okay, because that n has to provide the counterforce to p to keep it in equilibrium. And this gives us a nice uh, little distribution um, equation in which n is equal to p. Uh, and we could plot that. Right, so over the whole length of um, our rod, the internal normal force would be equal to p. So we know the internal normal force is the same at any cross section. Uh, and what we can also figure out then is that that member, uh, the material there will experience the same amount of stress uh, at every cross section. Uh, and this gives us this equation here for average stress in an axial, axially loaded bar, uh, that P divided by the cross-sectional area A. And if this is constant, uh, then this is a really easy problem, right? We know that that average stress is going to be the same uh, at any point in the bar, at the center of the bar, near the edge, up here at the top, down here at the bottom. Uh, we're going to have the same... Uh, same average stress. Now this is true uh, whether P there is compressive or tensile, right? Whether it's pulling or pushing. Uh, so that makes this a little more flexible. But we need to recognize that there's uh, that a little bit of an oversimplification. This is really uh, pretty accurate for the middle of the bar. But if we wanted to find the stresses right near a point of application, uh, we'd have to do a little bit more work. Uh, there's going to be some, some problems there. All right, so let's do a little uh, example here. So we have uh, a bar of constant cross-sectional area here, 
and we want to find the maximum stress. And here we've got a, a more complex loading, so we're not going to be able to say that the stress everywhere is the same. So uh, we can use that same equation, though, that this average stress is equal to P over A, as long as we find the particular internal resultant force here and here and here. So this is just like those force distributions that we did uh, in the last lecture, where we have a, 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 a concentrated load, like right here. We're going to get a jump in the internal resultant force here. Uh, and so we want to basically find ourselves a nice function to describe um, the internal resultant forces in this bar. But we know that from here to here, those internal resultant forces are going to be the same. So we'll start off with the first question here. And I just want you to look at this bar and think about the way it's being loaded um, and see if you can come up with a guess about where that axial stress is highest. So go ahead and pause. And now that you've uh, answered that question, we can move on to the next question. So if we wanted to find the resultant force, now we're going to find that force distribution, right? Um, that uh, basically make a normal force diagram here. Uh, we'll use the method of sections. And so if we divide the section here, and it could be here or it could be here, we know it's going to be that resultant force is going to be the same all through here. We get a pretty uh, simple uh, free body diagram here. And we can observe that that internal force between A and B is going to be 12 kilonewtons. Now, notice again that we didn't define where we made that section between A and B, so it's going to be the same everywhere between A and B. It's going to be 12 kilonewtons. Now, it's going to change at B. Uh, so when we apply that force at B, the internal force is going to jump uh, up or down, right? Uh, so let's see which of those it does. If we look at our section here, and again, we've divided our, use the method of sections, basically somewhere in here, um, we can solve for n. And this is a little tricky, this drawing. This is, it looks like there's only one 9 kilonewton force, but we're actually, there are two 9 kilonewton forces here. And so we can solve for n, b, c and find that it's 30 kilonewtons. So we see that it jumps up, right? And we can uh, make some good sense of that, right? There's going to be this force is pushing this to the left, uh, and so it's pulling it away from these two forces over here. And so we're going to have a fairly large force in here. So now there's a second question for you, so take a second and answer that. See if you can find that force between C and D. All right, so if we're unpaused there, we'll go on to the next slide. And basically what we found here now is the distribution of normal internal forces in the bar. Right? From A to B, it's 12. It jumps up with this 18 kilonewton force there all the way to 30. Jumps back down with this 8 kilonewton force here and um, stays there till the end of the bar. And if you think about this, this every point in here has to be at equilibrium. That's all we're doing. We're just solving a little statics problem. Right? So Going to the left, we have 12 plus 18, 30. Over here, we have 8 plus 22, 30. So we're at equilibrium there. We're at equilibrium here because we have 12 to the left. And let's see, minus 18 plus 8 makes minus 10 plus 22 makes 12 to the right. So at any given point, everywhere we have to be in equilibrium, and that's all we're doing in order to find this distribution function. 
So now we know the maximum internal force. So if in that first question you guessed BC, you'd be correct, right? Because everything on the left is pulling to the left, everything on the right is pulling to the right, and so that internal force is going to be largest in the center. And finding the stress is uh, really fairly trivial in this case because we know we have a, um, a constant cross-section. So we'll uh, use our stress equals force over A, or over area. We'll take our kilonew 30 kilonewton stress that's in between B and C, or 30 kilonewton internal force, rather, and divide that by the area. And those numbers, 35 millimeters and 10 millimeters, are given in the problem. And we solve, and we get an answer in pascals, or in this case, uh, in megapascals. Um, and that's fairly common. A pascal is a pretty small number. And the, the forces that we're dealing with when we talk about beams uh, are generally pretty large. And so we're going to get, we're going to see a lot of uh, megapascals and even gigapascals. So your last job is then just to find the average stress in uh, section CD. And that's the last question for Moodle. And you'll use the same process that we did up here. Okay, talk to you next time.